of my family, um, you, most of you know Jonathan and Laura. So uh, Jonathan is married to Charlotte, they're up in um, Manurewa, they've bought a house in Manurewa. And uh, Laura and Matthew are living there in the same house, in one room. <laughs> So that's worked out well. They seem to get on well with each other. So, nice. so that's good. So they're up in Auckland, and then Ben, you know, uh, as well. So that's my family. Okay. The largest gathering of people in the world in one place for one purpose. How many, when, where, and why do they gather? How many? Where, well, let's start with where. You should be able to guess that. Because of where I've been. It's in India, yeah. It's the Indi in India. Uh, where and when? It's, uh, uh, you probably won't guess the, the where. No, Kenneth and he might have figured out a fellow. That's every 12 years. Ganges. Yep, it's the Ganges River, that's right. The Mahakum, they call it. There it is, wow. there they are. So um, they call it the Mahakum, the big celebration. Well, the trip, did it close for coronavirus? Uh, no, they wouldn't close it if it, if it timed for coronavirus. No, well, they might try, but they wouldn't be successful. So how many, how many people do you think gather in this one place every 12 years? It actually goes for a month, but there's seven auspicious times to vote. Too many to count. Mm -hmm. 40, 40. 40 to 60 million gathered. Wow. Allah bad normally is about a million and a half people. So you imagine 40 million coming into Allah bad to celebrate. They put up temporary everything. So this is what the people are doing. What are they doing? Can see the picture. What are they doing? They're praying. They're praying. They're in earnestly praying. And what are they earnestly praying about? Why do they bathe in that? It's all to do with karma, but if we were to put it in terms we might understand, they are praying that God will take away their sin. With every, all the wrong things they do. And 40 million of them will gather there because they believe that they can wash their sins away in a dirty river. And I find that really sad. I find it sad that in this day and age there are still millions of people gathering without really a false hope. And they are very earnest people. I don't know about you, but there's no way I would join 40 million others on the banks of a river in a tent for a month. No, no. Okay. So, Kenneth and Hannah are down there. If you want to know more about uh, northern India, have a chat to them. They're stuck here also. <laughs> um, so we can pray for Kenneth and Hannah that they get the visas. They want to go back to the U.S. So WEC, who's WEC? WEC is a mission organisation founded by C.T. Studd. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Famous C.T. Studd verse. The dream is to see Christ known, loved and worshipped by all the peoples of the earth. We work in Asia, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Pacific, Latin America. Kenneth is um, one of our Pacifica people. Uh, we work all around the world uh, doing all sorts of things. Our core DNA, you might say, core values is another thing, is, love, is loving Jesus, but reaching people planting indigenous, multiplying churches, mobilizing and training for mission and showing compassion to the needy world. So Uttar Pradesh, the state I, uh, Jillian and I lived in for a while, has how many, many, it's the size of New Zealand, that's what I always tell people, 
Same size as New Zealand. 200 million people that are there. And how many know the Lord? Well, yeah, a lot less than 1%. <laughs> people are going to go So, so WIC does a whole lot of things. Children in crisis, drug rehabilitation, radio programming, medical work. We run NK schools, uh, do creative arts, film translation research, just about anything you can name um, WIC's involved in, in somewhere in the world. Uh, and what are we, why are we doing that? To reach people with the gospel message. One of the really exciting um, ministries, which is probably only the last three, four, uh, maybe five years, is uh, IMM, International Mission Mobilization. This is a multinational, um, this is aiming at reaching people uh, in the countries. We would normally send missionaries too. Now we are... Uh, training people in these countries to go throughout the world. So uh, some of you would know John and Alison Watson. So they have been heading up. Now Pat the Myers do. And they're um, basically going to these places, challenging them with the call to missions. And uh, a couple of, not this year obviously, last year I think they had... Uh, in one part, I don't even, don't even know if I should tell you where, but they had 36 over the year, 36 missionaries do the CO calls, which is quite amazing. So, here's the question. This is your, I, I forgot to bring the chocolate bar. What's the difference? So this is an aerial shot of 31 and 35. 21. 21. 21. <laughs> College guys, eh? what, what's the difference? The colour of the roof. The colour of the roof, you've got it. Uh, if I had a chip, you, you shouldn't be allowed to. Who <laughs> knows the answer? I shouldn't let Craig answer that. I should have said no, Craig. The colour of the roof. That's right. There is uh, these. This is a little while ago, but these are sort of red, dark red, and these are grey. Are you still grey? Yeah, mostly, yeah. 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 Because they had to repaint some of your roof. So what's the difference? Okay, uh, what do I do? What does Ross do? Um, um, so my, uh, one of my jobs is uh, heading up the mobilising team. And uh, I imagine many people say, so what is mobilising? So uh, we send the teams, there's about four of us, but we're not, I don't think any of my, well, a couple of us are full time. Anyway, there's four of us on the team. Uh, so we did, but temporarily halted, uh, send people around the world on short-term mission trips. We are committed to working with the local church, in other words, mobilising people for mission, but also equipping the New Zealand church um, to reach out to those coming here, especially those from overseas. So we run, um, one of my favourite things is running the, uh, our local workshops um, and talking to people in the church, helping them to reach out to Cross cultures to their neighbours. So we have all sorts of workshops. My remarkable neighbours connecting with the unfamiliar Hindus, me and God, because of my Indian background. So yeah, I'm like Jillian said, deputy branch uh, leader as well. I um, <coughs> keep pretty busy between what I'm doing here at Oaks and uh, what I'm doing here at work. We are all volunteers, none of us are paid a wage or anything, so we rely on the support of the church, of which I am 
very thankful and appreciative. Both Gillian and I are both support over the years uh, financially, but even more importantly, your friendship and prayers is really crucial. Um, and thank you for that. Just came across some stats that I thought the need is still great. Do you know that we have now 900 plus, according to the American Bible Study not, uh, uh, Society, 900 plus English translations and paraphrases of the Bible? 900 plus. I was trying to think how many Hindi ones I knew of, and they have Urdu and Hindi. Hindi is spoken by something like 400 million people, and then there'd be what? Another two or 300 million plus that know it. I think when we were there, there were three possible translations, and two of those were really old, you know, King James type translations. You find that really interesting, isn't it? We have 900 plus, they have three or four translations. I told you before, what was it, Pradesh, 200 million? Yeah. Have other countries where God's at work as very few people who know Jesus. So I thought um, I, I would finish. Um, for those of you who are waiting for the sermon part, <laughs> <laughs> I would finish with a word. It's something I've been wrestling with um, the last little while. Success in the Christian life. Uh, what is it? How do we measure it? Should we even measure it? Success in the Christian life. And it was brought upon by this. Oh, I didn't put the three questions there. Huh? What is it? How do we measure it? Should we even measure success as Christians? And it, it, I, I was uh, prompted to think about this. Well, I had been thinking about it. And then I read Deuteronomy chapter 3. At that time I pleaded with the Lord and said, O Sovereign Lord, you have only begun to show your greatness and the strength of your hand to me, your servant. Is there any God in heaven or on earth who can perform such great and mighty deeds as you do? Please let me cross the Jordan to see this wonderful land on the other side, the beautiful hill country and the Lebanon mountains. So who said this? Moses, yes, Moses said it. So why did Moses not enter the promised land? There has never been another prophet in Israel like Moses, that's what the Bible tells us, whom the Lord knew face to face. Why would God deny faithful Moses entry into the promised land? He was a humble man of God, diligent in what he did, and yet the desire of his heart was not granted. I put here, did it come down to one moment of folly? Because if you read um, some of the accounts of Deuteronomy, that's what it seems. Because that one uh, moment of folly, you might say, is, well, I'll speak for myself as, I make mistakes all the time. <laughs> Moses, what, did Moses make one mistake and because of that he was denied entry to the promised land? Deuteronomy 32 says, For both of you, that's Aaron and Moses, betrayed me with the Israelites at the waters of Meribah, the Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin. You failed to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel there, so you will see the land from a distance but you may not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. What a bummer. Forty years wandering in the wilderness with these people, you know, the nation of Israel, and then you don't get to do what he, Moses was longing to do, which was to see the promise fulfilled and enter into the promised land. Deuteronomy 3 says that the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. That's enough, he declared. Speak of it no more, but go up, look over the land, take a look, 
because that's the last thing you're going to see. Then you're going to die, and Joseph's going to take Josh, um, Joshua. Is it right? Is going to take this these people into the promised land. Hmm. Uh, I found an old commentary, and he wrote this, which is quite interesting. The guy wrote this: Whoever you may be. Have you not dreamed here below of a promised land? Have you not desired it? Have you not thought to reach it? And has not a voice been heard telling you also, Thou shalt not enter it at all? Yep, I'd be really cheesed off. Moses' fate is painful, even tragic. Standing before the people, he is so steadfastly led, he prepares not to shepherd them triumphantly into the promised land, but to install a new leader who would bring them to the destiny. It is, for moment, Moses, a moment of enormous sadness. So have you had moments like that? Unfulfilled dreams, promises that have, well, don't seem to have been kept. Frustrations at not being able to see God move like you'd love to see him move. The crazy thing is that uh, this uh, was doomed from failure at the, at, from the beginning. Yeah. Failure was certain. <laughs> it's pretty rough, isn't it? Here you are called to take the people into the promised land and it's just like being told, well, it's not going to happen, so don't worry. <laughs> You're not going to accomplish what, you, what I'm calling you to do. Hmm. Don't know. Yeah, Moses had the odds stacked against them. In Deuteronomy 33, Moses himself says, Israel is a senseless nation. The people are foolish, and they are without understanding. So this is the whole generation that's going to, pass away before Moses is able well before they can go into that's 40 years but it's interesting uh, there we read also that Moses lacked one other thing unlike his predecessor Abraham and we read of this in numbers 11. Uh, not only in Numbers 11, but several. This is one example. This would not be the final time that Moses did not put his trust totally in God. But Moses responded to the Lord, There are 600,000 foot soldiers here with me, and yet you say, I will give them meat for a whole month, even if we butchered all our flocks and herds. Would that satisfy them? Even if we caught all the fish in the sea, would that be enough? Then the Lord said to Moses, has my arm lost its power? Now you will see whether or not my word comes true. Moses did not put his trust totally in God. He was, in fact, you could compare him to Abraham. Abraham, what was accounted to him? Righteousness is faith. So, practice application for us the journey of a lifetime perhaps the biggest single hazard of our lives that's your life and my life is mistaking the small story for the big one letting all our energy enthusiasm and intention get consumed in those good stories at the expense of the best and most important what is the most important story who you are becoming. Your journey to become your true self, the person God knows you to be, that is the journey of a lifetime, and that will last forever. So, so well, you know, I get tied up in the small stories, mostly. I look to the small stories, and I judge my success or failure by what's going on here and there. You know, youth group. How many kids are coming to youth group? Oh, you know, does that really matter? The opportunities I'm having to 
share the gospel with people. No, no, they're all important. But is that the big story? Moses had to do faithfully what he was called to do and abandon the outcomes to God. We are called to do what God has called us to do and leave the outcomes up to him. Success is all about faithfulness to the It's not about what you are doing, but about who you are becoming. That's really hard. Well, for me, I find it really hard. Because I constantly, well, compare myself to other people. But each of us has a call <coughs> from God. How are we going on that, on what God has called us to? This is where we need to live, constantly with our sense of call before God and who we are becoming. That is where success truly lies. Let me pray. Oh. Lord, I thank you that you do call us. Lord, help us to be faithful to what you have called us to help us to leave the results in your hands, Lord. Help us to be the people that you want us to be. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us. And that if we put our trust in you, help, put our trust totally in you, then you will look after us, you will guide us. You will lead us. You will bring us to the promised land.